Chapter 10 of The Defiant Agents by Andre Norton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Defiant Agents. Chapter 10 Beyond this, Menlik worked his way to the very lip of a drop, raising a finger cautiously. Beyond this, we do not go. But you say that the camp of your people lies well out in the plains. Jill Lee was up on one knee, using the field glasses they had brought from the stores of the wrecked ship. He passed them along to Travis. There was nothing to be sighted but the rippling amber waves of the tall grasses, save for an occasional break of a copse of trees near the foothills. They had reached this point in the early morning, threading through the pass, making their way across the section known to the outlaws. From here they could survey the debatable land where their temporary allies insisted the Reds were in full control. The result of the conference in the South had been this uneasy alliance. From the start Travis realized that he could not hope to commit the clan to any set plan, that even to get this scouting party to come against the stubborn resistance of Declay and his reactionaries was a major achievement. There was now an opening wedge of six Apaches in the north. Beyond this, Menlik repeated, they keep watch and can control us with the caller. What do you think? Travis passed the glasses to Nolan. If they were ever to develop a war chief, this lean man, tall for an Apache and slow to speak, might fill that role. He adjusted the lenses and began a detailed study sweep of the open territory. Then he stiffened. His mouth, below the masking of the glasses, was tight. What is it? Jill Lee asked. Riders, two, four, five. Also something else, in the air. Menlik jerked back and grabbed at Nolan's arm, dragging him down by the weight of his body. The flyer! Come back! Back! He was still pulling at Nolan, prodding at Travis with one foot, and the Apache stared at him with amazement. The shaman sputtered in his own language, and then, visibly regaining command of himself, spoke English once more. Those are hunters, and they carry a caller. Either some others have escaped, or they are determined to find our mountain camp. Jill Lee looked at Travis. You did not feel anything when the woman was under that spell? Travis shook his head. Jill Lee nodded and then said to the shaman, we shall stay here and watch, but since it is bad for you, do you go, and we shall meet you near this place of the towers. Agreed?" For a moment Menlik's face held a shadowy expression Travis tried to read. Was it resentment, resentment that he was forced to retreat when the others could stand their ground? Did the Tatar believe that he lost face this way? But the shaman gave a grunt of what they took as assent and slipped over the edge of the lookout point. A moment later they'd heard him speaking the Mongol tongue, warning Huligar and Luchu, his companions on the scout. Then came the clatter of pony hoofs as they rode their mounts away. The Apache settled back in the cup, which gave them a wide view over the plains. Soon it was not necessary to use the glasses in order to sight the advancing party of hunters. Five riders, four wearing Tatar dress. The fifth had such an odd outline that Travis was reminded of Menlik's sketch of the alien. Under the sharper vision of the glasses he saw that the rider was equipped with a pack strapped between his shoulders and a bulbous helmet covering most of his head. Highly specialized equipment for communication, Travis guessed. That is a copter up above, Nolan said. Different shape from ours. They had been familiar with helicopters back on Terra. Ranchers used them for range inspection, and all of the Apache volunteers had flown in them. But Nolan was correct. This one possessed several unfamiliar features. The Tatars said they don't bring those very far into the mountains. Jill Lee mused. That could explain their man on horseback. He gets in where they don't fly. Nolan fingered his bow. If these Reds depend upon their machine to control what they seek, then they may be taken by surprise. But not yet. Travis spoke sharply. Nolan frowned at him. 
Jill Lee chuckled. The way is not so dark for us, younger brother, that we need your torch held for our feet. Travis swallowed back any retort, accepting the fairness of that rebuke. He had no right to believe that he alone knew the best way of handling the enemy. Biting on the sourness of that realization, he lay quietly with the others, watching the riders enter the foothills perhaps a quarter of a mile to the west. The helicopter was circling now over the men riding into a cut between two rises. When they were lost to view, the pilot made wider casts, and Travis thought the flyer's crew were probably in communication with the helmeted one of the quintet on the ground. He stirred. They're heading for the Tatar camp, just as if they know exactly where it is. That also may be true, Nolan replied. What do we know of these Tatars? They have freely said that the Reds can hold them in mine ropes when they wish. Already they may be so bound. I say, let us go back to our own country. He added to the decisiveness of that by handing Jill Lee the glasses and sliding down from their perch. Travis looked at the other. In a way, he could understand the wisdom of Nolan's suggestion, but he was sure that the withdrawal now would only postpone trouble. Sooner or later the Apaches would have to stand against the Reds, and if they could do that now while the enemy was occupied with trouble from the Tatars, so much the better. Jill Lee was following Nolan, but something in Travis rebelled. He watched the circling helicopter. If it was overhanging the action area of the horsemen, they had either reined in or were searching a relatively small section of the foothills. Reluctantly, Travis descended to the hollow where Jill Lee stood with Nolan. Tsoe and Lupe and Rope were a little to one side, as if the final orders would come from their seniors. "'It would be well,' Jill Lee said slowly, "'if we saw what weapons they have. I want a closer look at the equipment of that one in the helmet. Also,' he smiled straight at Nolan, "'I do not think that they can detect the presence of warriors of the people unless we will it so." Nolan ran a finger along the curve of his bow, shot a measuring glance right and left at the general contours of the country. "'There is wisdom in what you say, elder brother. Only this is a trail we shall take alone, not allowing the men with fur hats to know where we walk.' He looked pointedly in Travis' direction. That is wisdom, Ba'ise," Travis promptly replied, giving Nolan the old title accorded the leader of a war party. Travis was grateful for that much of a concession. They swung into action, heading southeast at an angle which should bring them across the track of the enemy hunting party. The path was theirs at last, only moments after the passing of their quarry. None of the five riders was taking any precautions to cover his trail. Each moved with the confidence of one not having to fear any attack. From cover the Apaches looked aloft. They could hear the faint hum of the helicopter. It was still circling, so a reported from a higher checkpoint, but those circles remained close over the plains area. The riders had already passed beyond the limits of that aerial sentry. Three to a side, the Apaches advanced with the trail between them. They were carefully hidden when they caught up with the hunters. The four Tatars were grouped together. The fifth man, heavily burdened by his pack, had climbed from the saddle and was sitting on the ground, his hands busy with a flat plate which covered him from upper chest to belt. Now that he had a chance to see them closely, Travis noted the lack of expression on the broad Tatar faces. The four men were blank of eye astride their mounts with no apparent awareness of their present surroundings. Then, as one, their heads swung around to the helmeted leader, before they dismounted and stood motionless for a long moment, in a way which reminded Travis of the coyote's attitude when they endeavored to pass some message to him. But these men even lacked the signs of thinking intelligence the animals had. The helmeted man's hand moved across his chest plate and instantly his followers came into a measure of life. One put his hand to his forehead with an odd, half-dazed gesture. Another half-crouched, 
his lips wrinkling back in a snarl. And the leader, watching him, laughed. Then he snapped an order, his hand poised over his control plate. One of the four took the horse reins, made the mounts fast to nearby bushes. Then, as one, they began to walk forward, the red bringing up the rear several paces behind the nearest Tatar. They were going upslope to the crest of a small ridge. The Tatar who first reached the crest put his hands to cup his mouth, sent a ringing cry southward, and the faint, Hoo! 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 echoed on and on through the hills. Either Menlik had reached the camp in time, or his people were not to be so easily enticed. For though the hunters waited for a long time, there was no answer to that hail. At last the helmeted man called his captives, bringing them sullenly down to mount and ride again, a move which suited the Apaches. They could not tell how close was the communication between the rider and the helicopter and they were still too near the plains to attack unless it was necessary for their own protection. Travis dropped back to join Nolan. "'He controls them by that plate on his chest,' he said. "'If we would take them, we must get at that.' "'These Tatars use lariats in fighting. Did they not rope you as a calf is roped for branding? Then why do they not so take this red, binding his arms to his sides?' The suspicion in Nolan's voice was plain. Perhaps in them is some conditioned control, making it so they cannot attack their rulers. I do not like this matter of machines which can play this way and that with minds and bodies, flared Nolan. A man should only use a weapon, not be one. Travis could agree to that. Had they not, by the wreck of their own ship and the death of Ruthven, escaped just such an existence as these Tatars now endured? If so, why? He and all the Apaches were volunteers, eager and willing to form new world colonies. What had happened back on Terra that they had been so ruthlessly sent out without warning and under Redax? Another small piece of that puzzle, or maybe the heart of the whole picture, snapped into place. Had the project learned in some way of the Tatar settlement on Topaz, and so been forced to speed up that translation from late twentieth-century Americans to primitives? That would explain a lot. Travis returned abruptly to the matter now at hand as he saw a peak ahead. The party they were trailing was heading directly for the outlaw hideout. Travis hoped Menlik had warned them in time. There. That wall of cliff to his left must shelter the valley of the towers, though it was still miles ahead. Travis did not believe the hunters would be able to reach their goal unless they traveled at night. They might not know of the ape things which could menace the dark. But the enemy, whether he knew of such dangers or not, did not intend to press on. As the sun pulled away, leaving crevices and crannies shadow-dark, the hunters stopped to make camp. The Apaches, after their custom on the war trail, gathered on the heights above. This red seems to think that he shall find those he seeks sitting, waiting for him, as if their feet were nipped tight in a trap," Soe remarked. "'It is the habit of the Pinda Lik Oyi, Lupi added, to believe they are greater than all others. Yet this one is a stupid fool, walking into the arms of a she-bear with a cub," he chuckled. "'A man with a rifle does not fear a man armed only with a stick,' Travis cut in quickly. "'This one is armed with a weapon which he has good reason to believe makes him invulnerable to attack. If he rests tonight, he probably leaves his machine on guard.' "'At least we are sure of one thing.' Nolan said in half-agreement. This one does not suspect that there are any in these hills save those he can master, and his machine does not work against us. Thus at dawn he made a swift gesture, and they smiled in concert. At dawn, the old time of attack. An Apache does not attack at night. Travis was not sure that any of them could break that old taboo and creep down upon the camp before the coming of new light. 
but tomorrow morning they would take over this confident red, strip him of his enslaving machine. Travis' head jerked. It had come as suddenly as a blow between his eyes, to half-stun him. What? What was it? Not any physical impact. No, something which was dazing but still immaterial. He braced his whole body, awaiting its return, trying frantically to understand what had happened in that instant of vertigo and seeming disembodiment. Never had he experienced anything like it. Or had he? Two years or more ago, when he had gone through the time transfer to enter the Arizona of the Folsom men some ten thousand years earlier, that moment of transfer had been something like this, a sensation of being awry in space and time with no stable footing to be found. Yet he was lying here on very tangible rock and soil, and nothing about him in the shadow-hung landscape of Topaz had changed in the slightest. But that blow had left behind a quivering residue of panic buried far inside him, a tender spot like an open wound. Travis drew a deep breath which was almost a sob, levered himself up on one elbow to stare intently down into the enemy camp. Was this some attack from the other's unknown weapon? Suddenly he was not at all sure what might happen when the Apaches made that dawn rush. Jill Lee was in station on his right. Travis must compare notes with him to be sure that this was not indeed a trap. Better to retreat now than to be taken like a fish in a net. He crept out of his place, gave the chittering signal call of the fluff-ball, and heard Jill Lee's answer in a cleverly mimicked trill of a night insect. "'Did you feel something just now, in your head?' Travis found it difficult to put that sensation into words. "'Not so. But you did?' He had. Of course he had. The remains of it were still in him, that point of panic. Yes. The machine? I don't know. Travis' confusion grew. It might be that he alone of the party had been struck. If so, he could be a danger to his own kind. This is not good. I think we had better hold counsel away from here. Jill Lee's whisper was the merest ghost of sound. He chirped again to be answered from Tsoe upslope, who passed on the signal. The first moon was high in the sky as the Apaches gathered together. Again Travis asked his question, had any of the others felt that odd blow? He was met by negatives. But Nolan had the final word. This is not good, he echoed Jill Lee's comment. If it was the red machine at work, then we may all be swept into this net along with those he seeks. Perhaps the longer one remains close to that thing, the more influence it gains over him. We shall stay here until dawn. If the enemy would reach the place they seek, then they must pass below us, for that is the easiest road. Burdened with his machine, that red has ever taken the easiest way. So we shall see if he also has a defense against these when they come without warning." He touched the arrows in his quiver. To kill from ambush meant that they might never learn the secret of the machine, but after his experience Travis was willing to admit that Nolan's caution was the wise way. Travis wanted no part of a second attack like that which had shaken him so, and Nolan had not ordered a general retreat. It must be in the war chief's thoughts, as it was in Travis, that if the machine could have an influence over Apaches, it must cease to function. They set their ambush with the age-old skill the Redax had grafted into their memories. Then there was nothing to do but wait. It was an hour after dawn when Soe signaled that the enemy was coming, and shortly after they heard the thud of ponies' hoofs. The first Tatar plodded into view, and by the stance of his body in the saddle, Travis knew the Red had him under full control. Two, then three Tatars passed between the teeth of the Apache trap. The fourth one had allowed a wider gap to open between himself and his fellows. 
Then the Red Leader came. His face below the bulge of the helmet was not happy. Travis believed the man was not a horseman by inclination. The Apache set arrow to bow cord, and at the chirp from Nolan, fired in concert with his clansmen. Only one of those arrows found a target. The Red's pony gave a shrill scream of pain and terror, reared, pawing at the air, toppled back, pinning its shouting rider under it. The Red had had a defense right enough, one which had somehow deflected the arrows. But he neither had protection against his own awkward seat in the saddle, nor the arrow which had seriously wounded the now threshing pony. Ahead the Tatars twisted and writhed, mouthed tortured cries, then dropped out of their saddles to lie limply on the ground, as if the arrows aimed at the master had instead struck each to the heart. End of chapter 10